Good morning. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you all. Well, if your Bibles are still open, if not, uh, turn again there to Mark 5 and we'll carry on uh, with what we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. Uh, but before we do so, let me open in a word of prayer for us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for just uh, yeah, hearing uh, what a testimony, uh, just again to your glory and what a joy it is to know that you are a God that is uh, involved in our lives um, and that you are calling us to yourself. And Father, I pray that uh, as we turn to your word, that uh, we may continue to trust in you and your call uh, upon our lives to know you, to trust you, to believe in you. And we thank you, Father, that you have called. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. So this morning we are looking at uh, the next section, Mark 5, verse 21 through to 43. Um, it may be a familiar section. All of these kind of sections in Mark is relatively familiar, but perhaps we don't spend enough time zooming in, particularly on this story or these two stories. They're kind of interwoven. Two things are happening at once. You have uh, Jairus, who is coming to Jesus because his daughter is ill and on her deathbed. And you have the sick woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. And is desperately seeking uh, the healing of Jesus. Um, and it's a difficult passage in one sense to preach. Because before we even look at it, the question that one wants to ask is, well, what does this mean for us? Uh, does it mean that Jesus is going to come in and he's going to come into our moments, our situation, our suffering, our circumstance, and he's going to just heal us and change it? Uh, how does it look? Obviously, this is Jesus' physical ministry here on earth. It looks different to what we know today. Uh, Jesus is not sitting here in this room physically, tangibly. We can't touch his robe. We can't ask him to come with us in the physical sense. So it makes it a little bit difficult to actually get our heads around. How great it would be if Jesus was sitting here. Uh, anybody who would like to touch his robe? Right now? Yeah, it seems like a good idea. Anyone want to fall at his feet right now? And ask him for something. The next question that maybe we need to ask is, well, what has changed other than the fact that he's physically not here? Does he not remain God? Does he not remain good and able to do these things? Simply because he's physically not here, does it mean that he can't do it? Or doesn't want to do it. These are the kind of things that start going through one's mind. As you look at a passage like this. It's a great passage to turn to and say, see, this is the reason why God will heal. This is the reason why if we reach out to him, he will heal us. He will rescue us. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Because unfortunately... There's context, there's space, there's time in which he was doing certain things for certain reasons. And we are in a different space and time to that right now. But it doesn't mean that he changes. So before we get underway, I want that to be at least running through our heads and our hearts. The Jesus that we are reading about here and now isn't different to the Jesus that we believe in. He's still got the same power. He's still got the same authority. He's still got the same grace and mercy and heart for restoration and healing. How that unfolds just looks slightly different, perhaps. So the story begins in verse 21 with what's taking place. It says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat, and now we've obviously seen the last couple of weeks as to and fro cross from one side of the sea to the other side of the sea. And now he's again, he's shifted across, according to Mark. He's on the other side of the lake. And a large crowd have gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, this is important just to notice, it's one of the synagogue leaders, not just anyone. He's a religious leader within the community he serves. He's one of the leaders in the synagogue named Jairus came 
And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. That's the first picture that we get. First situation. Jairus has a daughter. And this is something quite interesting just to note. So just a side note. There's a connection of sorts, at least with time, between Jairus' daughter and the woman. I don't know if you picked that up. The woman had been suffering for as long as Jairus' daughter had been alive. Jairus' daughter was 12. The woman that is suffering had been suffering for 12 years. That is insane if you think about that time frame. Just something to kind of get us to really feel the weight. So here's this man, Jairus, a synagogue leader, most likely respected within his community, falls to his knees before Jesus, begging him, pleading him that Jesus will come and heal his daughter. Not just any form, but particularly focusing in that he wants Jesus to lay his hand on his daughter. This is important because, again, there's a slight flip to what happens with the woman. So, Jesus ends up going to Jairus, and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail in, in a moment. But he ends up going there and he lays his hands on this girl, and she is healed. But let's take a look at what happens with the woman. Verse 24, so Jesus went with him, so he's on his way now to Jairus' house. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. So just pausing there, it's interesting that there's two different approaches for these two different groups, two different people, to get healing. The one is, the synagogue leader calls Jesus to come and lay his hands on his sick child. And then you have this woman, who is by definition unclean. Unclean, unworthy to even touch other people. Because as soon as you do that, by definition you make other people unclean with you. So she sneaks up in the crowd and she touches Jesus and she is healed. So the one case, there's a cry for Jesus to go and lay his hands on someone. And in the other case, someone is healed by touching the hem of his robe, his cloak. This throws a bit of a spanner in the works for us. Because if we, being human, want to figure out a formula... This tells us that there isn't one. And that is frustrating because now we can't look at this and say, oh, this is how we can get healing. This is what we can do. Because in one case, someone falls to their knees and asks Jesus to come with them, and Jesus comes with and he heals. In the other case, someone sneaks up and touches his cloak and they get healed. So how does Jesus' healing work? It's complicated. There isn't a formula. There isn't an answer. Not in the way that we would hope. How great it would be if we were sitting here and we could say, okay, if you want to get healed, if you want to get saved from your circumstance, if you want to get out of the predicament that you're in, these are the three things that you need to do in this order. That would be great, because we'd all do it. If we knew it would yield results. But this just demonstrates that that's not how it works. Here is a woman contrasting the first person that comes, Jairus being a synagogue leader, needing to be clean, pure, and upright in his community. And there is a woman that is recognized as unclean. Either should not be there or should be letting people know that she is unclean. She comes up behind Jesus and touches his cloak. It's probably created an underlying predicament of sorts. I wonder what the discussion followed 
with the fact that Jesus was touched by someone that was unclean and then still went to the synagogue leader's house to heal his daughter. And that would have been a bit of an odd. What do you do? But it seems to have happened in any case, and Jesus did what needed to be done. But here, Jesus is. He is touched. His cloak is touched by this woman. Verse 28, because she thought, notice what it says, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. That's what was going through her mind. The woman's mind was simply this. If I can just get close enough and touch just a part of his robe, maybe I will be healed. And she was. Verse 29, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. But at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the crowd against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? A logical kind of deduction. It's like walking through the mall at Christmas during a sale and trying to figure out who touched you. And it's next to impossible. Have you ever tried walking through the mall at Christmas or on a Black Friday sale? Imagine the two combined. And you're going to get bumped on all sides. And here Jesus senses and feels that power has gone out from him. What that means, I don't know what exactly he felt, but obviously him being all-knowing and being God, he can know these things. But there he is, and he says, someone has touched me. Who is it? I want to suspect that he probably knew who it was, because it feels like it's something that he would know. But his request to say, who touched me, is to see the woman's response. And this is what's quite beautiful. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. So this is the second time in a short section where someone has fallen at Jesus' feet in fear and trembling. Both for similar reasons. The one is out of desperation and fear. The other one is out of fear of awareness of what God, what Jesus has just done. Two incredible pictures. But fear is evident. In the midst of needing healing, in the midst of suffering, there is a sense of fear. But what do you fear? Remember last week, kind of an aspect is if Jesus driving up someone that had been demon-possessed, like uh, this man in the previous section, he can only be, if the demons were driven out, it means that Jesus was more powerful than the, than the demons. And therefore that's why the crowd, the people, were afraid. And here again, I think there is a sense of awe and awareness of the power of Jesus. Particularly for this woman. She comes and falls at, a, at his feet because she realizes who Jesus is and the power that Jesus had to heal. Verse 34, he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So that kind of ties this woman's story to a close. He moves on from this. But here in the middle of Jairus's request, and, his, and Jesus' actual healing of the daughter of Jairus, you have this account. This unclean woman that reaches out, touches his robe, is healed, and falls at the feet of Jesus in awareness of who Jesus is, that he is powerful, that he has authority, and she is healed. She has faith, and therefore she is healed. Faith enough to reach out. Faith enough to try. Faith enough to hope that this one that she is trusting in, that she reaches out for, will heal. Verse 35 becomes a rude interruption 
if you want. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Jesus is being delayed in his movement to the house. And in the process, it seems as though this little girl, 12 years old, has passed away. She is dead. But this doesn't seem to sway Jesus. Overhearing what they said in verse 36, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. Simple little line that Jesus says, but I think it is fundamental for what we are going to look at as we, when we wrap this up. We're going to come back to that, but don't be afraid, just believe, is what Jesus says to them. Verse 37, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. I don't know if that strikes you as Bizarre, but that shift from wailing and crying to actually laughing in the face of it all. Um, it is probably the emotions of it all. Or it could be perhaps just a, yeah, and no faith, no trust that this is possible. And so it is almost ridiculous. So as he arrives, they are laughing at him because he is convinced that she is just asleep. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples, the three that he took with him, who were with him, and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talita kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So you may ask, why did Jesus say that it is most likely that he didn't want the synagogue leaders to have this further discussion because it wasn't yet Jesus' time to die and to go uh, and well, to die on the cross. And so there had to be this limitation to what would happen Jesus knowing full well that he healed not not just anybody but particularly in this case the synagogue leader's daughter whereas the woman in the crowd was slightly more disregarded in a sense by society so it wouldn't matter but particularly this case Jesus heals someone very intric intricately involved in what is to come uh, in his story at least but here he heals her she gets up and then, I love that last line, and told them, give her something to eat. We don't know exactly what is wrong, but for this morning at least, uh, maybe it's a nice little thing to just look at. In the face of this, uh, he asks them, them to feed her, give her something to eat. So what do we make of this? I mean, these are two very interesting, very unique um, Stories, ones that, as I say, if Jesus were here, would look a lot different physically. If he was sitting in one of the seats, it would look different. But for us today, it's harder to actually take this and say, This is how it applies for me. Standing here personally, I would love it if it were possible, and it probably is but I have most likely a lack of faith on one sense. But it would be great if Jesus was physically, tangibly around, that we could touch his robe, that we could invite him to our house and he could heal, restore. Personally, I would love it. It would be great. It would change the immediate frustration, daily obstacles of life. It would be good. 
But unfortunately, it just isn't that easy. A little bit longer we face suffering here on earth. A little bit longer we endure it. But it doesn't mean that Jesus Christ doesn't care. It doesn't mean that he wants us to suffer. It doesn't mean that he enjoys the fact that we suffer. Nor does he want us to fear him. Nor does he want us to fear our circumstance. I think in some sense, it's exactly that. His call to us is, don't be afraid. Just believe <coughs> seems too simple to say that that may be the most important thing for us. But in this life where it feels like Jesus isn't as physically present, that we can touch him and he can change things, can we hold on to those words, don't be afraid, just believe? Is that enough for us today? I know that most mornings I wake up and it's not enough. Don't be afraid of what today holds or what you feel is inevitable. Just believe. Sometimes it feels so hard to believe in the face of fear, in the face of hardship. But don't be afraid. Just believe. Why do we have a guarantee? Why do we have something that we can believe in? It is because this is the building story for us, to see the power of Jesus, the power of Jesus to heal a woman that is, by all accounts, unclean, undeserving, untouchable. He heals her. She's a nobody. She has nothing, and he restores her. And on the flip side, it doesn't matter how righteous you may come across, but he has the power to even heal those in position of authority. Jesus' grace extends to the nobodies and the somebodies. His healing is there for anybody who has faith, anybody who believes in him. He is willing to heal. But how? Well, the greatest predicament of all, and wrapped up in this resurrection of this little girl, shows us that he has the power over death. This is a prelude to what he will come and do. This is setting the tone to show that he is not only able to do it in others, but he will be the one that conquers <coughs> death, ultimately. So our guarantee, what makes these words of don't be afraid, just believe, a guarantee for us is that when we look at the story of Jesus Christ, we don't have to be afraid because we have the account of Jesus Christ and what he has done, how he has conquered sin and death, how he died on the cross for our sins, how he rose again. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has done that? I think it's almost unfair what he says to the parents, to Jairus and those that he, he took with him. To just, don't be afraid, just believe. Because they had not witnessed Jesus do something of this magnitude. For us, we have account after account after account of Jesus' power, and ultimately we see the culmination of that in his death and resurrection. For us to understand what he meant by don't be afraid, just believe, is far greater, far more tangible than what they may have known, even though they could get him to come to their house. For us to know what Jesus has done, and it has stood the test of time. It doesn't take away the fact that it would be great if he was here right now. But he has given us his Holy Spirit. 
He has given us his spirit. That we are not alone. He hasn't entirely abandoned us. But he has given us his spirit. Which is bizarre. Because when we think about his spirit, we think, again, I want something more tangible. That the Holy Spirit who lives in us is the one who seals our life in him. He seals us with his Holy Spirit for the day that he will come and call us home. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Simple. Difficult. As I say, I, I would love to hear that. Don't be afraid. Just believe. If life actually went a bit smoother. Because it feels like it would be easier. So I'm not coming at this passage in any sense from a point that this is easy. But he has given us everything to guarantee and secure us in himself. You don't need to be afraid. His power is greater. He is stronger. He has greater authority than anyone or anything. Do you believe? This morning, do you believe? He may not take away your suffering right now, but he will save you. And he has saved you. When he returns, all of this will fade away. Just a little longer. We may face hardship just a little longer. But trust in Him. Don't be afraid. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for just a reminder that you are a gracious God. That you do want to heal. That you do want to give life. And in a world that is so broken, it is so often difficult to recognize that. But it doesn't nullify the fact that you have come into this world. You have healed. You have restored. And ultimately, you will come to claim us. To resurrect us. So when all is done, our future is secured in you. No matter what this world right now may throw at us, we do not need to be afraid. May we trust in you, in your all-powerful, gracious, merciful God. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.